Thank you, Carl. <clears throat> Again, this is Jeff Novak. Um, I'm with the USDA ARS in Florence, South Carolina. Carl invited me to speak briefly on using biochars to improve carbon sequestration and fertility. Uh, to accomplish that task, um, I've structured a talk where we're very briefly going to look at biochar terminology. We'll talk again very briefly about pyrolytic production, some of the salient features of biochars in terms of their characterization, and then we will hammer some of the uses of biochar to solve South Carolina soil problems. Uh, to do that, I have to go back and talk a little bit about the morphology, some of the physical problems that we face, and why would we want to use biochar in these soils as an amendment. Uh, we'll then look at two published studies that occurred in a Norfolk soil, and then I was invited to come down to Florida, the, the um, uh, sugarcane production place down there, and talk a little bit about the adding biochars to a margate, which is one of the soils down there considered for use uh, for sugarcane production. Uh, very briefly, biochar, if you look at Lehman and Joseph's definition, is that if you it's charred material applied to soils with the intent to improve soil properties. Uh, this is a very general terminology, but again, it's uh, hosted here by Lehman and Joseph. Speaking with Carl, uh, with uh, Kurt's focus often, we get into the discussion that there are alternate terms used to describe biochar depending upon your scientific background and your bias. The old literature talks about it as charcoal. Organic chemists talk about black carbon. Char is one of the smaller words that I use to refer to biochar. And finally, when you talk to the food science industry, they talk about activated carbon. So speaking with Kurt, he reminds me that this is a continuum. And depending upon who you're talking with, you need to be familiar with all these terms. Uh, overview of pyrolysis. Here in South Carolina, we have a lot of local feedstocks in quite a bit of abundance, including pine chips, switchgrass for biofuel production, and we're loaded up with animal manure. So you'll see through my presentation, these three feedstocks are very commonly featured. Uh, pyrolysis is essentially heating material in a chamber under very low oxygen conditions. Depending upon your selection of manufacturing conditions, you can optimize gas production, thin gas. You can optimize for liquid. Or you can optimize your system for biochar production. Uh, I would like to go through now two slides which, in my opinion, show the salient features for biochar. Excuse me, I was up one. That is the pH of the material. This is a very important characteristic of the biochar. I cannot overemphasize how important this is. If you notice here on the feedstocks, we have a, a, quite a variety from corn, pine, poultry litter, and pyrolysis temperature. And we have differences in pH ranging from as low as 5.9 to as high as 10.3. So the take-home message from this is first, as your pyrolysis temperature increases, you have to increase the pH of the biochar material. That's due to the loss of the acidic volatile compound and the concentration of the salt in the ash. The second important feature that's in this table is that animal manure material, if that is your feedstock, has a tendency to be calcareous in nature. So those are your two important features here, the effects of the feedstock and the pyrolysis temperature. Another salient feature is the nutrient composition of the particular biochar. What we have here is if we look at some very common feedstocks here in South Carolina, and we look at the differences in their nutrient fertilizer ratios, as a function of pH, or excuse me, as a function of pyrolysis temperature, we have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. What I chose to highlight here was the numbers of phosphorus in red. Notice if you produce biochar from poultry litter, you have a very nutrient-improved material, particularly high in phosphorus and potassium. 
Wine manure, another manure source, follows analogously, I and P, I and K. Now, if you work with pine chips, notice that it is fairly devoid of nutrients. That is a very important feature when you're selecting your feedstock for your biochar. You want to select something like from a 2 by 4 and it doesn't have a lot of nutrients, versus animal manures where they're loaded with nutrients. So that's what we say down here, that manures, they have high fertilizer equivalents, and as you increase the temperature, you tend to concentrate those nutrients. Now, let's look at some of the soil morphology of South Carolina. Uh, approximately two-thirds of our state is in the coastal plain region. The majority of our farms are found in this region. Three very common soil types are the Coxville, located in depressions, the Norfolk, related on side slopes, and a Bonneau in very upslope positions as a deep sand. In spite of these conditions, it is commonly that the farmers will plant typical row crops, including corn, soybeans, cotton, wheat, tobacco, sorghum, and an assortment of truck crops. Now, some of our problems that we're faced here in the coastal plain is the first, our soils are between three and five million years old. Consequently, they are extremely weathered, meaning that they are dominated by kaolinitic clays. We have sandy textures, as you would expect, but also we have low carbon content, which causes our soils to have a poor ability to retain nutrients and water. If we take a look at some examples of that, we look at a carbon distribution for those three soils that were shown on the previous slide, the Bonneau, the Norfolk, and the Coxville. The Coxville is the poorly drained soil. Notice the carbon content is much higher throughout the profile. But as you look at the Bonneau and the Norfolk, we're dealing with numbers that are fractionary compared to the Coxville. In fact, these numbers in the topsoil can be as low as 0.5 to 0.2 percent organic carbon. The low carbon content causes some very big uh, problems with our soil. Um, the AP, as we said, does not have a lot of moisture retention capacity. We have fairly thick E horizons, which tend to lose that organic carbon over time. Consequently, these soils compact. They compact to the point where they could bend a half-inch soil probe here. And if you dig a soil pet on, you'll see that that lock of carbon and clay causes the soil to have no structure. This is detrimental for water availability because the roots can only grow here in the AP. They cannot get through the E when it gets hard as cement. So one of our other uh, avenues to work with this is to try to get biochar down in this zone, but that's another lecture. Okay, knowing that the soils have a very poor agronomic performance, a person can ask themselves, can we apply biochar to improve their fertility? This is why we're emphasizing this in this short presentation. Uh, as has been talked about by Carl in the introduction, biochars are being evaluated globally, and as what you would expect since they're carbon enriched, to improve carbon sequestration, improve soil quality, with the anticipation of hopefully raising crop yield. Uh, after I've been involved with this for over eight years now, it is very plain that there are several hundred reports showing both positive and negative influences on soil quality. A recent meta-analysis, which means an analysis of a large volume of published papers by Jeffrey here, showed that a positive yield increase of approximately 10% is possible by adding biochar. But there are other reports that show there could be no to minimal change in adding chars to soil. A recent study that we did with Karmat Sistani here, applying it to some of the soils in the Bowling Green location, finding not much change in the corn yield. So a person needs to be concerned with what they're applying to the soil with respect to biochar. Well, that caused us to go in and to do, and as we said, we're going to look at typical Norfolk, which is an ultisol in South Carolina, and as we said, it has low carbon content. 
And then we're also going to Margate Sand, which is an entosol down there in Florida. They have a very unique problem, is that when you walk the soil, there's shell, seashells in this material at the surface. Once you see seashells in the soil that have survived, you know that they have alkaline soil pH values. And if you have alkaline pH values, you start to get limits in your soil micronutrients, particularly copper, zinc, boron, manganese, causing irregular growth and color discolorations in the particular crop. So let's take a look at the Norfolk, where we applied approximately 40 metric tons per hectare, uh, incubated that Norfolk in the lab situation for 120 days. I've shown results here, and what is very paramount are the ones that are shown in red. But if we look simply at the pH, our control pH in the Norfolk is 5.6. If we add 40 metric tons per hectare, which is at the upper range of the commonly accepted application amount, notice the pHs using poultry litter and peanut hull are dangerously above the recommended 5.8 to 6.4 for corn. So a person needs to be careful with not increasing their pH beyond the limit that is extended by the extension service to grow a good corn crop. We also said that the biochars can increase soil organic carbon content, which is very plain here. 0.31 is your control. By adding this much char, look at how you tripled your carbon content. Malic-1 is our common extractant for nutrients the coastal plain here in the southeast, where you can look at P and K levels. Notice if you apply poultry litter, you end up with 1,647 uh, pounds per acre of malic 1P and quite a bit of potassium. This is a severe no-no. This should not be done. And the reason for that is look at the amount that's recommended, 31 to 80 pounds per acre. So by here, you have a factor of 20. This is one of the most important things that I lecture on when I give biochar talks is be careful of the phosphorus content, particularly if you start working with poultry litter. Peanut hulls, on the other hand, kept the phosphorus within range but jacked up the potassium amount. Folks are starting to notice that potassium is getting very expensive, so this is one of our emerging areas that we need to be concerned with. So the take-home message here is be careful of your you know, loamy soil, uh, be careful of your pH, and be careful of the amount of excess nutrients that you may add. The next one is of a Margate soil, which came from, again, Florida and Al Point. From the field, Don here, my support scientist, is shown mixing in the biochars. And here's an example of how we conduct our laboratory here in Florence. This soil is a little different than the Norfolk in that, please notice, the pH change or pH content already in the control is of calcareous. Remember I said a few minutes ago that you had seashells exposed? The seashells indicate or is a good index that your pH is over 7. And by adding these different biochars, bagasse, pine chips, hydrochars, and swine solids, notice we didn't do anything to the pH. That was because the organic carbon content is already high enough in the soil. It buffered that biochar being added at 10 metric tons per hectare. I'm sorry I forgot to point out that we added less material to this soil because we were criticized in the last slide that we applied 40, and they wanted to know why don't you apply a little bit more, uh, or excuse me, a little less that would be more acceptable to farmers. So we cut back on our application rate. The CEC contents changed a little bit, 6256, they dropped somewhat. Wine solids went up. So there's not a big change here at the tenth of a uh, percent or a centimole. But again, what we see here is shown in red with the Margate soil that if you work with manures, a person needs to be careful that they do not exceed the P and K. The reason that I'm hammering this point is because in this region, any P movement from these soils into the drainage canals is very closely monitored. We want to keep this out of the system down there because of the aquatic damage that it may occur. So this is something that we definitely need to watch when we're working in these Margate sands. We need to keep this phosphorus uh, down to levels that are balanced for the particular sugar cane crop. 
oh, excuse me. So if we wrap up this a little bit, we find the following. Biochars can improve carbon sequestration because, as you would expect, they're carbon enriched, but they are also can be nutrient poor because of feedstock selection and pyrolysis temperatures. So a person needs to be aware of that. What are you making the chars from, and what's the temperatures that you're making them from? Another important feature is that some of the biochar contain excess plant nutrients and are calcareous. And I don't need to mention to farmers who know that they strive to keep their soil pHs within the optimum limits, make sure that they make use of that fertilizer in an efficient manner. Finally, finally, these finding has led to the realization that not all biochars are effective at improving soil quality 